Following today's opening statements, uh, we will move into a panel discussion with our service members. And if you have questions for our panelists, you can use the raise your hand feature in Zoom, the chat function in Zoom, or you can unmute your mic. I will call upon those who have raised their hand and I will read the questions out loud to the panelists. Uh, and I'll do the same for those in the chat. The Zoom chat will be monitored throughout today's event. As a quick reminder to everyone, please keep your mics muted when not speaking. I'll go ahead and introduce everybody. So today's opening statements will be delivered by US Air Force General Brigadier, Brigadier General Michael Bruno, Director of Joint Staff Colorado National Guard, US Air Force Colonel Daniel Rajan, Director of Staff Hawaii Air National Guard, U.S. Air Force Colonel Michael Griesbaum, 168th Wing Commander, Alaska Air National Guard. Today's panelists are U.S. Air Force First Lieutenant Mao Lefiti, 150th Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron, Hawaii Air National Guard. U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant Kaibu Kau Panks, 109th Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron from Hawaii Air National Guard. U.S. Air Force Captain Bon Franks, 138th Electromagnetic Warfare, Warfare Squadron, Colorado Air National Guard. U.S. Air Force Captain Greg Wagner, 233rd Space Group, Colorado, Colorado Air National Guard. U.S. Air Force Tech Sergeant Raymond Ballard with 137th Space Warning Squadron, Colorado Air National Guard. And U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant Robert Brown, 233rd Space Group, Colorado Air National Guard. I'll be sure to include those names of our panelists in the chat for you all. With that, I'll turn it over to General Bruno to kick off our opening statements. Sir, if you please. Thank you, EP. Good afternoon, everyone. As EP said, I'm Brigadier General Mike Bruno, and I am the Director of Joint Staff for the Colorado National Guard. I've been a member of the National Guard both as an enlisted member and as an officer for nearly 39 years. Throughout my career, I've been both full-time as a federal technician and as an AGR or active guard and reservist, and as a part-time or traditional member, which is my current status. I got involved with the National Guard Space Missions in 1998 as the executive officer for the 137 Space Warning Squadron out of Greeley, Colorado. In 2002, I cross-trained into operations as a space and missile warning operator, then worked my way up to chief of operations training. From 2017 to 2020, I had the honor of commanding the service members of the 233rd Space Group, which includes the 137th Space Warning Squadron and the 138th Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron here in Colorado. As nearly all of our governors stated earlier this week in a letter to the Secretary of Defense, the Air Force's Legislative Proposal 480 would set a dangerous precedent and jeopardize our national security and military readiness by undermining the authority of the governors over the National Guard units in their states. When not activated, National Guard capabilities are under the control of the governors in accordance with U.S. law that is more than a century old. Overriding Title 32, Section 104, and Title 10, Section 18238 of the United States Code to allow Air National Guard space units to be pulled from a state's National Guard without governor approval sets a precedence that would then allow for any mission from either the Army or Air National Guard to be removed at any time without governor approval. The immediate transfer of Air National Guard space units to Space Force under LP 480 will also create a capability gap because a majority of Air National Guard space operators do not wish to transfer to the Space Force. Currently, the Air National Guard provides 60% of the Space Force's electromagnetic warfare capability and 33% of U.S. space capabilities, and has been performing space missions for nearly 30 years. Today, you will be hearing from service members in the Colorado, Hawaii, and Alaska National Guard about their reasons for not wanting to transfer to Space Force's new service without component construct. Without these transfers, the Space Force will have a capability and readiness gap that will take seven to 10 years and cost taxpayers approximately $1 billion to fix. As I speak, Air National Guard members from Colorado are currently deployed overseas in harm's way, providing critical space capabilities in support of combatant commanders. Yet these space professionals may not have a military job to come back to when they return. 
They volunteered to serve and sacrifice for their nation, state, and communities. I can only imagine how they and their families must feel if we break that trust with them. As I wrap up my opening comments, I wanna stress that first and foremost, I am concerned with the implications of LP 480 and the precedents it would establish. Separate from LP 480, the simplest, most timely and most cost-effective solution to connect the Air National Guard service members performing space operations to their parent service is to create a Space National Guard. A Space National Guard can be established at no cost to the Department of Defense with a simple zero balance transfer of existing programmed resources to continue to fund existing Guard space missions at current levels to meet Space Force mission requirements. The only cost, and it is a one-time cost, would be approximately $250,000 for new heraldry items, clothing items, and unit signage. But this $250,000 can be funded with existing National Guard Bureau appropriations. So again, no additional funding, no additional military construction. The Congressional Budget Office report that was released about four years ago did not accurately portray the associated cost of establishing establishing a Space National Guard with the current 14 units in seven states. All right, a little bit outside my lane, but national security and readiness is everyone's concern. I'm also concerned with talent retention of the current part-time Title X reservists performing space operations as the Space Force works out the details of how to transfer them into this new service without component construct. A Space National Guard would be a great partner to the Space Force in helping retain this talent since we already have the processes in place to manage a part-time force to include in operational positions. For nearly four centuries of conflict and disasters, and most recently the global war on terrorism and a pandemic, the National Guard has ensured our way of life by being always ready, always there. LP 480 is a solution looking for a problem. The National Guard has never been the problem. We are the solution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Colonel Rajan. Thank you and good morning. I'm Colonel Rajan, the Director of Staff of the Hawaii Air National Guard. The Hawaii National Guard is standing up two electromagnetic warfare squadrons, one on Oahu and one on the neighboring island, Kauai. There are 91 airmen hired and placed in these units, and more airmen are recruited into these units every week. Legislative Proposal 480 concerns the Hawaii National Guard because of the potentially un, uh, negative unintended effects these actions will have on our airmen and our nation's ability to, to achieve our national defense strategy. The majority of the 91 airmen in these units do not want to transfer from the Air National Guard to the United States Space Force. If LP-480 succeeds, most of these airmen would choose to remain in the Hawaii Air National Guard and retrain into other missions. This in turn would, would create new personnel, training, and facilities costs for both the Air National Guard and the Space Force. These 91 airmen chose to serve their nation and also their state in times of emergency. Personnel from our space unit on Kauai participated in the Hawaii National Guard's response to the Lahaina wildfires on Maui last year and the National Guard model of an operational reserve where our personnel can support both their state and their nation is a tremendous resource to our communities, saving lives, preventing suffering, and mitigating property damage. If LP-480 succeeds, projections show that the loss of space professional expertise would create a seven to 10 year U.S. space warfighting capability and capacity gap. We simply cannot give our adversaries even one year to catch up or surpass our space capabilities. This is time we cannot afford to lose if we're to compete with, deter, and if called to do so, defeat threats to national security. Here in the Pacific, the airmen assigned to our space units have already fostered vital space-focused relationships with allies and partners throughout the Indo-Pacific, efforts that LP-480 places at risk. To sum up, high airmen in our space units have shown that their knowledge and experience are vital to our state and our nation and should remain in the Hawaii Air National Guard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Colonel Griesbaum, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Colonel Michael Griesbaum. I'm uh, calling in from Tampa, uh, Florida at McDill Air Force Base, but I am based at Eielson Air Force Base, Alaska. I'm the commander of the 168th wing up there. Uh, I have been in the Alaska Air National Guard since January, or sorry, April of uh, 1991. Uh, spent the majority of my career flying search and rescue in Alaska. 
uh, had uh, spent two and a half years as the director of operations and plans for 11th Air Force and uh, one year as the chief of staff for Air National, Gu Air National Guard operations uh, at uh, the National Guard Bureau or at the Air National Guard Readiness Center at Andrews Air Force Base. Um, I assumed command of the 168th wing in October uh, of 2021, which is when uh, I became involved in the space mission. Uh, the Alaska Air National Guard is unique uh, in the space mission and that we operate at a geographically separated unit uh, called uh, Clear Space Force Station. It's located about 120 miles uh, from Ielson Air Force Base, about 90 miles from uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, it is for active component personnel, a one year remote assignment. Uh, for my people who work out there, uh, it is their job uh, and they, they uh, live and uh, thrive and raise their families in Alaska. Uh, we supply about two thirds of the uh, ballistic missile defense uh, and space domain awareness uh, radar operators and also uniquely 100% of the base security. Um, I am deeply concerned about LP-480 and I wanna echo uh, uh, General Bruno and, and Colonel Rathian's uh, uh, statements. LP-480 is an existential threat to the Air National Guard. Nothing legislatively ever happens once. Uh, if LP-480 is successful, uh, it will open the door to a wholesale uh, uh, harvesting of National Guard resources, both from the Air National Guard and the Army National Guard, to the regular components. Uh, as General Bruno said, it is a solution looking for a problem. Uh, there is no mission failure that Space Force can, can point to uh, that would lead us to the conclusion that LP-480 is necessary in any way at all. Uh, Air National Guard members have been performing this mission for a generation, for 20 years. Uh, they've been doing it faithfully, they've been doing it well, uh, and they have served their nation. LP-480 represents a betrayal of their commitment. Uh, they join the Air National Guard for the reasons that the rest of us join the Air National Guard. They want to live in a specific location. They want to raise their families there. The Space Force uh, LP-480 proposal does not give them that, uh, and it breaks faith with those airmen. Our internal survey indicates about 70% of our personnel would retrain or retire rather than join the Space Force. Uh, in our particular case, that would res represent an existential threat to the national security of the United States because the Space Force does not have the experience uh, to replace my space operators who will depart. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this time, we will move to the panel discussion. We are now open for your questions. As I said, you could use the raise your hand function, you could utilize the chat, or feel free to unmute your mics and ask your questions of our panel members. Yes, Mr. Perez, please go ahead with your question. Hi, Simone Perez with Military Times. Um, I was just curious about what conversations are like between the National Guard and the Space Force and Air Force regarding this piece of legislation. Like how much communication is there? It has it been, <clears throat> excuse me, has it been, you know, you guys just fall on two different sides of the fence and, you know, are going to, a decision will be made or is there still conversations and discourse to try and you know come to a comparable solution for everyone with what they think is needed general bruno do you want to go ahead and answer that question for us sir absolutely thank you and thank you for the question so the conversation on lp480 specifically is pretty much being handled at the legislative and the gubernatorial level so the governors have weighed in, they've sent a letter to the Secretary of Defense, uh, 53 of the 55 governors across the uh, United States and its territories uh, wrote the letter. Uh, so we're letting that all happen at the legislative le level. Uh, as for taking care of our service members and how do we move forward and how do we continue to do missions, uh, we continually work with US Space Force 
uh, like I said, we currently have a unit from Colorado that is deployed. Um, we, uh, back when uh, Ukraine was invaded, um, our folks up in Greeley at the 137th were activated in place uh, to do their space and missile warning missions. So we still are working side by side to make sure that we don't drop the ball on readiness and we don't drop the ball on mission success. Uh, but LP-480 again is an existential threat and we're letting uh, the politicians handle that one. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anastasia, please uh, feel free to unmute and ask your question, ma'am. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Kendall said that um, there is no intention to move anyone, you know, and that the concerns are kind of overblown. Uh, just wanted to get your reaction to that. Colonel Rajan, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I appreciate the uh, the question. Um, with the legislative proposal 480, there are, there are so many unknowns uh, that we don't know about what a potential transfer of the units, the missions, uh, the personnel from the Air National Guard to the United States Space Force uh, would look like. So uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't, there are so too many unknowns to really comment and give you a definitive answer. Um, as to what exactly uh, that would look like in terms of units moving to different geographic locations. We also know that the Space Force has not defined the model for part-time participation uh, in the Space Force. Uh, that's a key component given that approximately 80% of a, a normal Air National Guard unit are what we call drill status guardsmen, which are part-time personnel that have full civilian careers. And then they also serve their state and their nation uh, through drill participation, annual training, as well as General Bruno mentioned through supporting deployments, um, directly accomplishing the national defense strategy. So we don't know what that model looks like. Uh, what we do know is that there are advantages to keeping these capabilities in the Air National Guard, specifically when you look at uh, enabling personnel to continue to do their full civilian careers where they are now under the model of participation in the Air National Guard that has, is a proven model to maintain operational capabilities for the United States military. We also know that there are key advantages that the Air National Guard, or the National Guard provides, such as our state partnership program. Um, this is a, a, a program that's integrated with the combatant commands that's focused on building um, partner and U.S. military and defense capabilities and capacity through enduring relationships. So we do subject matter expert exchanges uh, and other engagements, both in the United States and in our partner nation. Uh, we know that key to building these relationships are the, the long-term nature of those relationships that we build. And uh, given the model of an active duty um, change of assignment cycle where personnel are rotating in and out every two to four years, versus in the Air National Guard where personnel can remain in one location, one unit for 20 years and build those established relationships um, that our model is more conducive to building those long-term partnerships that are really key to being effective in our, our area. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Does anybody else have a response for that question before I move on? General Bruno, sir. So if I could, so I'm actually gonna read the legislation as it's currently written. Uh, so the Secretary of the Air Force may not move the Space Force unit, equipment, or billets associated with the covered space functions out of the affected state until the Secretary of the Air Force has notified the Congressional Defense Committees of the details of such a move and provided an explanation regarding why the move is necessary to support the defense strategy and a period of 120 days has elapsed after the notification has been received by those committees. So the current Secretary of the Air Force has said he's not planning on moving them, but the way the LP is written, future Secretaries of the Air Force absolutely can go in there, provide 120 days notification, and then move those units out of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hadley, sir. Hi, thanks for doing this. Greg Hadley with Air and Space Forces Magazine. My question is, is for anyone on the panel 
Could you speak to your own personal reasons for wanting to stay in the guard and why you would not want to, or why you would cross train into another career field if this legislative proposal were to happen? Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and start with uh, Lieutenant Lefiti, if you'd like to answer that question, sir. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the main reason why I joined the guard was to assist my community uh, prior to joining to the guard, I was in the educational sector working with a lot of the community school groups and knowing that I was able to assist in the federal mission and being able to help my community has just been such a huge benefit of being in the guard. Um, that being said, uh, just with the Space National Guard proposal, as well as the Space Force construct, the uncertainty of that um, is is. It's pretty much that. I, I, I love staying home in Hawaii. I love all the people that I work with. The institutional knowledge that the Guard provides, um, that's just such a wealth of just wealth and huge amounts of information and knowledge that gets passed on. So I love being here. I don't want to leave. And just the uncertainty and the ability to possibly be switched because we are an operational squadron, I'm kind of in a tactical role, and the uncertainty of being maybe moved into who knows what they may be is cause for concern. So um, those are some of the reasons why I joined the Guard, love serving my community, love the mission itself, and um, all that it provides. Over. Thank you, sir. Captain Franks, would you like to answer the question as well? Yeah, I can I can add a little bit on there. And I think that, I mean, really, some of the major concerns that stand out, right, are, are the lack of a path uh, for folks like me that have a regular civilian job that we attend. Uh, I did. I hadn't heard the 120 day uh, notification uh, bit until now, and I mean that's not enough time for me to uh, transfer within my own job. And then, I mean, the the lack of a a clear path for part time service members in the space force as well is is a concern. Uh, but I think maybe like the the bigger picture comes to me. Uh, I was on active duty uh, in the early 2010s, and. Uh, there was a pretty significant fire, the Waldo Canyon fire in Colorado Springs. And on active duty, uh, we were doing a lot of um, kind of like makeshift firefighter training so that we could go help. Uh, but the the red tape process for us to become uh, able able to go help the, the firefighters with that uh, natural disaster, uh, it ended up being too much. And so we went through all this training uh, and weren't able to do, I mean, really anything for a very devastating fire. And now I think about my time working with the guard and uh, a lot of my coworkers uh, facilitated the COVID-19 pandemic and folks that I went to college with are out in Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska, responding to those uh, tornadoes that occurred out there. So uh, I don't know. I think that for me, it's it's a much more involved uh, role in the community. And that's, I think, a distinct advantage that the guard brings that uh, would be very absent with the Space Force. Thank you, sir. Do any of our other panel members want to talk about their own personal experience in response to that question? Yes, ma'am, I would like to. Um, this is Staff Sergeant Kuhupu Hanks with the 109th uh, Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron. Um, aloha, everyone. Good morning. So I've been in the Hawaii Air National Guard for about six years now. Uh, I joined for the reasons of, you know, finding a means to have my, my uh, school paid for, I wanted to learn a technical trade, but most importantly, I wanted to stay home. Um, the Guard provided me, uh, more specifically, the Hawaii Air National Guard provided me the opportunity to not only support federal missions, but also state missions. Um, I feel that the model of being able to protect not only my country, but my state, my home, you know, my family, um, aligned with what I wanted in life, hence why I joined the Hawaii Air National Guard. So going back to the question, um, I wouldn't cross train into the Space Force active duty, um, not only for those reasons, but also as everyone before me had mentioned, um, there's, no, there's no clear route towards, um, how do I say, my, my career progression, at least for me personally. Um, you know, within the Hying, the Hawaii Air National Guard, I have a clear career progression towards you know, getting a chance at possibly obtaining the command chief of the Hawaii Air National Guard, switching over to the space active duty. I'm uncertain of that, as well as, you know, how promotions would work and um, 
even how like order systems would work. Um, yeah, so those are those are my main reasons. Thank you. And I saw that uh, Sergeant Brown. It looks like you were about to respond as well. Yes, I was. Thank you, uh, Seth Sergeant Brown uh, from the two thirty third as well. Um, so I had previously served uh, about ten years in the active duty Air Force. Uh, during that time, I had met my wife, and we had our firstborn son. So we really started to ingrain our roots into the community. Uh, our whole support system is here as well, uh, friends, family, and uh, some of the best orthopedic specialists in the nation uh, for my son's medical treatments. Uh, unfortunately, being active duty kept me away from my family a little too often, and it didn't suit the goals I had for uh, supporting my wife and son. Uh, but because I love this nation and I love the state, uh, I wanted to continue my service through the Air National Guard, and I uh, didn't run the risk of getting stationed anywhere far from home. Uh, currently, my wife and I are expecting a daughter in uh, just about a month, uh, so that really enforces our need to stay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, much. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, Ms. Shelley, if you'd like to respond. Hi, thank you. Shelley Mesh with Inside Defense. Um, General Bruno, I wanted to ask uh, specifically, I believe you mentioned that um, you don't agree with the CBO estimate that there's going to be recurring costs in the $100 million range. Um, could you tell me why you think that's wrong and where you are getting your um, estimates from? And then another follow-up question is, um, why isn't the Guard working more closely with the Space Force to discuss this? Why isn't there that communication going on about what some potentials might be? So first of all, Shelley, thank you very much. So there are going to be the ongoing costs, and those ongoing costs are already in the National Guard's budget. The CBO uh, report from June of 2020 pretty much said it was going to cost between four and nine hundred million dollars to establish a space National Guard. And what their concerns or their comments were was that every all 54 states and territories would get their own space National Guard. That's not the way the process works. Uh, Secretary of the Air Force, uh, COCOMs first have a demand signal on what requirements they have, and then the Department, the Department of Defense makes a determination on who's best suited to meet that requirement. So let's say it's more electromagnetic warfare. So obviously it's gonna be Space Force. And then the Secretary of the Air Force decides where that's gonna go. Is it gonna go active duty? It, it, now there's no active duty on the Space Force side of the, high, the, side of the house. So it, will it go to Space Force? Will it go to the National Guard? So the states can't just set up their own Space National Guard. So that's the part I'm talking about that the report got it wrong, that it's not gonna cost four to 600 or four to $800 million to establish the Space National Guard. It's about $250,000. Uh, individuals go in on a Saturday morning of drill wearing the Spice Brown of Air Force. They walk through the gate, they go through their building to go to their equipment, do their job. Sunday, if there's a Space National Guard, they swap out their name tapes for the blue of US Space Force. Uh, somebody has spray painted space over air on the uh, sign out front of the gate, and they go through the same gate, they go through the same building, they do the same job. That's where that $250,000 comes from. Now, when you talk about working with uh, Space Force, at the national level, so National Guard Bureau and U.S. Space Force are working closely together to get through this. LP-480 is kind of a one-off. So we've been working with them trying to figure out what the best solutions are and then LP 480 dropped. And as was said earlier, um, I think Dan out of Hawaii said it, excuse me, uh, Colonel Razian uh, said it, it's an existential threat to the National Guard. Uh, they've talked about, you know, it's a federal mission. Well, all of our missions are federal missions because we're organized, trained and equipped to be the operational combat reserve to the Army and the Air Force right now. Our job is to fight our nation's wars, but it's because of this training and the equipment that we're able to support our communities and our state. So does that answer your question or did I not get to the root of it? I believe you answered it, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, we'll move on to Mr. Cameron. 
I'm sorry, Cass Cameron, could you please respond? <clears throat> so I'm with KKTV 11 News out of Colorado Springs. Um, my question is a little multifaceted. Um, a few, just a few days ago, actually, it was May 1st, um, a SPOC here uh, implemented the Spofferjin model. And so right now, we're kind of, they're kind of restructuring pretty much everything going on here at Space Base Delta One um, and everything going on with their war fighters, even the, the fifth, everything there. Um, as that's happening, there's a lot of moving parts. Is this just the wrong time? Is this the wrong time to be making this moves? Is it too much at once? Is there a future time where this could happen? Is that part of the problem? Or is this as, um, I believe it was Colonel Grisbaum who said um, that this is just a solution looking for a problem, that this is going to be an ever present kind of thing. Like, is there maybe everything's happening all at once? Um, or is this just an absolute no from, from all of you? General Bruno, I'll hand that one off to you, sir. So uh, Space Force, Jen. So just so you know, the way that uh, right now, because we're still aligned under the Air Force, we are doing AF4Gen still. So that's the way we're uh, mobilized, trained, everything along those lines. So that is part of the disconnect as we get further and further away from our parent service for the uh, people performing space operations. That's just another disconnect that it becomes harder and harder for us to do these missions. So the timing of this. So LP-480 is our primary concern on this one. Uh, that That is just, again, it's, it, it's overriding gubernatorial authority. It's pulling the units and the equipment and the uh, installations out of the Air National Guard and putting them in the Space Force. Now, timing-wise and a lot going on, um, we've actually up until this point for the last four years have been trying to work with Space Force uh, and the Air Force and Department of Air Force and DOD to establish a Space National Guard because that is a, one of the recommended COAs uh, is to establish a Space National Guard. Does it have to happen today? It, it actually doesn't. So we can continue doing this the way we're doing it, which is status quo. LP-480 needs to go away, but if Space Force wants to come to the table, if LP-480 falls off the table and they decide, hey, we need to work on what's next, we're here. Uh, the, the Air National Guard, every single person on this screen that's in uniform or serves in the National Guard is concerned with national security, operational readiness, uh, when we're in great power competition with our adversaries. So we all want the right thing and we're ready to sit down and do that but lp 480 is truly an existential threat to the national guard as a whole so there is still time to do the other parts colonel region colonel Griesbaum, would you guys like to add to I, yes i would um so the issue with the timing of lp 480 and the question of whether or not there's ever a good time the way LP-480 is formulated, the answer is no, there is never a good time uh, because it, it strikes at the very uh, heart of the existence uh, of the National Guard and of the authority of the governors uh, and our role as the primary uh, combat reserve for the active forces. The other issue with this, though, is, as we as I said and as other folks have said, it's a it is a solution in search of a problem. But people are acting based off of what LP 480 proposes. So we will begin to see the loss of experienced space operators long before the Space Force will ever be able to make up the loss of that uh, uh, experience and proficiency. So we will see a significant hit uh, to the uh, national security of the United States because people will act in their own interest uh, and, and retrain or retire rather than join the Space Force. 
and the Space Force does not have the capacity to make up for that loss. So there, there's not a good time for LP-480. And I would argue, as, as uh, General Bruno uh, just said, we have, we have been doing this mission effectively uh, for a long time, and we can continue to do it effectively as great partners uh, to the U.S. Space Force. This is Colonel Rajan in Hawaii. I would just like to add um, some context to, to the gap in capability that losing these space professionals would create. Why is there that gap? Well, it's because the um, duties that these our space professionals are performing are highly complex. It takes about a year and a half to two years to train a space professional. Uh, and that's not something you can just do overnight. Uh, in addition, the career fields um, have very stringent requirements, both in terms of um, uh, science and mathematics backgrounds for our personnel that we recruit in. And those demographics can be um, challenging to recruit into at times. So again, it's just not something that you build uh, overnight. Thank you. So there is a follow-up question from Cass Cameron. Do you think that puts more pressure on the U.S. Space Force active duty members that are already a very small force with a large tasking, taking away their space operator support if they do choose to leave? General Bruno, do you want to go with that one, sir? Uh, so I, let me understand the question. So they're saying the, the question is, and Cass, if I get it wrong, please speak up. So if, if LP 480 comes to fruition and they take, they being U.S. Space Force, Department of Air Force, takes the billets, the equipment and the resources out of the guard and up to 86 percent of our members do not transfer to the Space Force, does that put added pressure on the current people in U.S. Space Force doing those operations? Is that the question? Yes. Can you, would you think that that does actually put more pressure on the current Space Force members? Uh, unfortunately, it would because there's still a demand signal from the COCOMs to provide electromagnetic warfare capabilities and things along those lines. And currently, the National Guard performs 60% of those operations. So between California, Colorado, and Florida, and soon to be Hawaii, we've been on constant rotation, 18-month rotations between the three states, so six months at a time, uh, providing uh, those capabilities to the warfighters. So absolute, absolutely, it provides a lot of pressure on those current folks doing that mission. Um, so that's... That's why we don't want 480 to come to fruition is it is, you know, as uh, Colonel um, Razian said, it, it's 110 months to get somebody to a seven level. So seven to 10 years, that's nine years, 110 months to get somebody proficient at the seven level to be able to do this mission. We're not even talking about all the leadership and uh, professional development that goes into uh, creating our space professionals. That's just the the ability to do their mission. So it creates that capability gap and it does place extra pressure on the, uh, on the individuals currently doing the mission. If I could, if I could jump in again, uh, at CLEAR for our ballistic missile warning, uh, ballistic missile defense mission, uh, two thirds of the crews are Air National Guard. Uh, so it would be more than stress uh, it's a gap that Space Force cannot fill. Uh, experience is also important. So uh, one, of, one of my uh, uh, members just uh, retired after a long and uh, successful career. He was the most experienced SFARS, which is the, the name of the radar or the designation of the radar. He was the most experienced SFAR operator uh, in the entire force, Space Force or Air National Guard. Um, it, that kind of experience takes literally a career to get. Um, at CLEAR, uh, my 213th Space Warning uh, Squadron folks perform the majority of the training for the active component, the majority of standardization and evaluation, uh, the majority of tactics. Uh, that, that experience gap uh, that LP-480 would, would create would be incredibly hard to overcome, literally years. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pro. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Reed. This is Colonel Raj, and I'd just like to add, um, we have two space units in Hawaii. One is what's called an offensive space squadron. The other is defensive, and it's it's one of two squadrons in the uh, Department of Defense the, that performs the defensive mission, so it would create significant burden in that mission. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Zaman Perez, please ask your question. Hi, yes, yeah, just a, another question. Um, in terms of the this internal survey that went out among the Air National Guardsmen, I was just curious what the parameters were, how wide ranging was that? Was that just at one particular base? Was that, you know, just from, you know, an internal like unit survey or was this a pretty far ranging? Because I think, you know, a, a headline, frankly, there is, you know, 70% of people aren't going to transfer over to uh, Space Force, causing a even greater strain on the service. So I just wanted to know where, where that 70 number was coming from. If it's 10 people, it's, that's different than a thousand, you know. General Bruno. I'm getting a lot of these questions. So, hey, great question. Thank you very much for asking it. So the uh, Assistant Adjutant General for the Colorado Air National Guard actually uh, there was two surveys. One was internal to Colorado, and then one went out to all of the seven states that are currently doing space missions. And that's the one that we're referencing the most often is that 70% up to 86%. Uh, so it was across all seven states, across the 14 units, across two, and we're going to use our numbers, uh, a thousand uh, space professionals currently doing the mission. Uh, so that it was across the board survey. Thank you. Before we move to our next question, we do have Captain Ian Matson from the 213th Space Warning Squadron in from Alaska Air National Guard. Sir, would you like to speak? Yes, this is Captain Matson. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I was just, uh, I wanted to talk more about why I chose Alaska. So I had spent nine and a half years active duty. I got my commission on active duty Air Force, and then I transitioned to the space career field. Um, I chose uh, Alaska Air National Guard because I was already up here doing the active duty mission uh, for the 13th Swiss up at Clear. And there was a position for me to transfer over, stay in Alaska. And I took the opportunity. I jumped in. I've been over on the guard side for about three years now. And the experience I've gained in these last three years for being an Alaska Air National Guard has trumped my whole experience as active duty. Um, I am uh, watching active duty side by side right now, try to navigate these waters that they're in, all these unknown waters. And personally, for me and for the majority of my squadron, we do not want to touch this beast at all. And it's not, it's not something pretty that's on the ground. And um, having my family here by my side where I can go home every night to them is what makes me want to stay in the Alaska Air National Guard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We do have a question in the chat from Mary Shin from the Colorado Springs Gazette. The question is, have you heard anything from the Air Force about releasing the study they have completed comparing the options for a Space National Guard, a single component, or leaving things as they are? Colonel Rajan, would you like to answer this question, sir? Uh, I apologize. I don't have uh, significant information on that. I um, would have to ask General Bruno or one of the other um, panelists to comment. All right, I'll take this one. So the 924 report, uh, Mary, I think is the one you're actually talking about. Um, I have a copy of the, uh, what's called the uh, leave behind or the one paper. Uh, and it pretty much just says it's cost neutral for the three reports. Uh, so this is the first report that's been released uh, there's been, uh, I think Congress has requested uh, five other reports prior to this, uh, and because they did not meet the narrative, um, 
All right, withdraw my comment. They were not released, and I'll leave it at that. So they were not released. Congress didn't get those reports, but this report says it is cost neutral, uh, and they are recommending the transfer of uh, National Guard forces into U.S. Space Force, um, and it, I disagree with it. So it's out there right now. Thank you, sir. Uh, Audrey Decker, Defense One. Hi, thank you all so much for doing this. General Bruno, just wanted to follow up on something that you said earlier that, um, you know, a space National Guard doesn't necessarily have to happen. I guess, could you just provide a little bit more detail on like what exactly you guys are advocating for? Is it for a space National Guard or is it just for things to stay the same? So I wanna be very careful how I used my words there. So it doesn't have to happen today. I still think Space National Guard is the right answer, but the fight today, and that's probably not the right term, but my concern today is LP-480 because existentially it's across the entire National Guard, uh, both air and army, that they can then come in and take these uh, units out of the National Guard, out from under gubernatorial authority. Space National Guard is still the right answer. So, and the great thing with the new Space Force Personnel Management Act or a service without a component, uh, which is law, it was in last year's NDAA. So with all the, the transition that's going on and General Saltzman has even said in a letter to the guardians that there's still a lot to be figured out as they try to do the transition specifically with the part-time force. With all that tumult and everything going on right now as they try to stand up this uh, service without a component, a Space National Guard is a perfect backstop for the force as people are trying to figure out transition and thing along the, things along those lines so we don't lose the talent that we currently have out there. Uh, that wants to remain you know, in their communities and things along those lines and don't want to worry about potentially still being PCS. So establishing a Space National Guard is important, but getting past LP-480 today is our most important thing. Uh, we will continue doing the mission. We'll work together with Space Force to figure this out, but a Space National Guard is the right answer after LP-480 is knocked down. Does that answer your question, Audrey? Yes, I guess, um, could you just touch on more specifically why a Space National Guard is the answer? Like why, why do states need a Space Force militia? So it's not about needing a Space Force militia, it's about needing that co operational combat reserve that can be fleeted up and actually go fight our nation's wars while having the training and everything else required to support our state and our com local communities. So it's not about the space missions, it's about the National Guard construct since 1903 under the Militia Act being the operational combat reserve to the Army and the Air Force and potentially Space Force. Okay, thanks. Absolutely. Do we have any additional questions from the media on the line? Please feel free to unmute if you cannot uh, use the chat or the raise your hand function. If you did dial in, you're more than welcome to unmute. This is Thomas Pavelli from military.com. I got a question. Go ahead, sir. Okay, great. Um, so I wanna get at this discrepancy over the numbers. So I know y'all are sticking with the 1,000 number of uh, space operators that would be affected by this. Um, the Air Force Secretary has, as well as members of Congress, have pointed that number closer to 600. Um, can you explain that discrepancy at all, either how they're getting that number or you're getting your number? Sir, that's on to you, gentlemen. So I and I hate I think, to be the only uh, one. This is Colonel Bruce. Um, Perfect. Uh, yeah, I I think that the, the discrepancy is um the uh, the difference between the actual operators 
and then the support personnel. So within it, within the 213 Space Warning Squadron that I own, we have uh, officer and enlisted personnel who actually operate the radar. And then we have additional personnel who do other things, support functions, things like that, within administrative functions, things like that. Um, in my case, I also have a security forces squadron that is completely dedicated to this mission that would be included in the 1000, but would not be included in the 600. And I, I, I think that that is the distinction uh, that the, uh, the secretary is drawing. Thank you, sir. General Bruno, Colonel Rajan, do you want to add to that? All right, I'll add just a little bit. So uh, Colonel uh, Griesbaum uh, stuck the landing on that. That is exactly part of it. The other part of it is they're not counting all the states. So I think that if I am correct, uh, they're not counting the triple deuce, uh, the 222nd out of New York, and they're only counting 11, uh, let's see here, they're counting nine units in six states, and we say 14 units in seven states. So they are saying some units aren't space units in their eyes. Uh, but what uh, Colonel Griesbaum said earlier um, is spot on. So putting it in Air Force terms, it would be like, hey, we only wanna take, we only need your pilots and your aircraft, but we don't need the maintainers, the armors, the refuelers to do any of that. We just want the equipment and the uh, operators. How are, yeah, that's not gonna work so well. So, but that's for another conversation. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions from the media on the line? Okay, uh, before we close out, uh, do any of our panel members have anything that they would like to add? Colonel Griesbaum, go ahead, sir. I do. Uh, it should be telling that with LP-480, there are seven states that have space missions and 53 governors who are opposed to the proposal. That should tell you everything about how, uh, how dangerous, how, how much of an existential threat this proposal is to the authority of the governors and to the uh, uh, Air National Guard. That's all. Thank you, sir. Any additional panel members have anything that they would like to add? Okay, thank you everyone. That's all the time that we do have for today. Thank you to all of our speakers and panel members for your time, expertise, and your perspectives. And to the reporters for taking the time out of your day to be here. Uh, if you have additional questions that were not addressed today, please do reach out to the Colorado National Guard Public Affairs team and we will run down answers for you. Our information will be in the chat shortly. Please have a great rest of your day. Thanks, EP. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, sir. And thanks, EP.